Viewed from the skies, the Rockies look like a pristine environment where animals can roam freely. But the closer look reveals a fragmented ecosystem. Roads, industries and towns are barriers impeding the wildlife's movements. Some species, like grizzly bears, face an uncertain future. But some researchers are trying to limit those impacts by putting forward bold conservation projects. Banff National Park is located in a strategic area of the Rockies, one of the rare valleys allowing east to west movement. But animals must face often deadly obstacles. Every year, trains kill bears. They're attracted to the rail tracks because of grains falling from leaky hopper cars. But the Trans-Canada Highway poses an even greater risk. Lawyer and environmentalist Harvey Locke has been fighting for decades to preserve BAMF's wildlife. At the time, we were having a very big debate also in the 1990s. Is, you know, all this came together that in Banff Park, we were developing commercial tourism facilities extensively, and they were beginning to cause problems with wildlife movements. And we were beginning to see at a very practical level that wildlife corridors can be blocked. During the 1990s, the federal government wanted to twin the Trans-Canada Highway in the park. It would become a very difficult obstacle to cross. And Locke thought the impacts would be felt on a much wider scale than the park itself. Actually, we called it the Berlin Wall of Biodiversity. That if you build that wall across this park, then you're cut off the south, you create an island problem to the south all the way to the United States, and that's unacceptable for a national park. But what could be done about it? In 1993, he had an ambitious idea to create a vast wildlife corridor along the Rockies extending from Yellowstone Park in the U.S. all the way to the Yukon. Locke wanted to link protected wildlife areas to one another so that animals could travel from north to south. That freedom of movement is particularly important for grizzlies. Grizzlies need a large territory to maintain a genetically diverse population. In 1850, they occupied most of the western half of North America. Today, they are almost gone from the lower 48 states, with only pockets left in Montana, Idaho, and in Yellowstone National Park. What we learned about national parks in recent times is that, uh, as important as they are as core breeding areas for wildlife, they're not sufficient unto themselves. And it's because for many species, they, they, they live at low population densities. And unless there's a very large connected population, if there's a, some kind of an important disturbance in their habitat, they have to be able to leave the area and then recolonize it. So we need to think about how we make connections between these islands so that they're no longer islands. In Banff, Locke and other environmentalists successfully lobbied Ottawa to build two large wildlife overpasses over the Trans-Canada. 22 underpasses were also built. Fences along the highway prevent animals from crossing elsewhere. The high volume of traffic requires such measures, according to researcher Tony Clevenger. There's, on average, during the summertime, more than 25,000 vehicles per day on this highway with peaks of 35,000. And that translates to, to basically one car passing every two to three seconds. Uh, so you can imagine how difficult it is for wildlife to cross the road. And when they do, the chances of them getting across safely is, is almost nil. These overpasses cost two and a half million dollars each to build, a controversial project because some thought the animals wouldn't even use them. Clevenger has been monitoring these crossings since 1996. Animals leave tracks on a sand bed. Yeah. That's something over there, it looks like. Yeah, possibly a bear, huh? And cameras with motion detectors record it all night and day. 
from our continuous monitoring of these structures, we've, we've found that there's a definite learning curve. There's an ad adaptation period for wildlife to use these structures. And for the large carnivore species, it's probably four to five years. The first year after these uh, overpasses were built, uh, we had one black bear and one cougar use the overpass. Um, and it's just increased over, over time. After a few years, animals learn to find and use the crossings. From grizzlies to elks to wolves and cougars, the crossings were used more than 90,000 times over the last 10 years. And the mortality rate dropped by 80% along the highway. With such positive results, Parks Canada is adding eight underpasses around the Lake Louise area. But are these crossings really helping to connect distant animal populations? It's an important question because studies show that inbreeding can put species at risk. Researcher Mike Sawaya is trying to answer that question by analyzing bear DNA. He collects hair samples that get caught in barbed wires laid across the crossing structures. We know, for instance, that maybe 348 grizzly bears have uh, passed through the crossings over the last 10 years, but is that 348 individual bears passing through once, or is it one bear crossing 348 times? It's really hard to say, so the very primary objective of my research is to determine the number of individuals using those crossings, but also to determine the gender. He also placed barbed wires on trees to the north and to the south of the highway to see if hair from the same grizzlies would show up in both places. Uh, normally bears just rub on the tree and sometimes you find a lot of hair on the bark but by putting up the barbed wire it allows for a discrete sample and it allows for a very nice sample to be collected as well. So we'll collect this hair and we'll send it to a, a genetics lab and what they'll be able to do is identify different individuals and then from that data we'll also be able to tell where those individuals move around on the landscape. Sawaya has identified 66 grizzlies in his research area. A dozen of them are using the crossings. I could say at this point that it looks like maybe about 10 to 20 percent of the population in the Bow Valley is using the crossing structures, which in my opinion is a significant amount. These measures have improved animal passage in the Banff area, but outside of the parks, things get more complicated. This is the next frontier for Yellowstone to Yukon. Because the Harvey Locke founded the, the conservation initiative from Yellowstone to Yukon, also known as Y2Y. They lobby government, industries, and landowners in order to facilitate wildlife passage. Really, the survival of large carnivores in this part of the United States is largely dependent on what we do in southern Canada on Highway 3. You know, the challenge is to work with private forestry companies, and there's at least one or two that are interested in how they can share the land. Um, I would like to say that everyone is enlightened and concerned about this in the same way that we are, and that would not be truthful. When no other options were available, the Y2Y group even bought some land. They did so in B.C. to protect one of the rare passages used by grizzlies to cross Highway 3. Locke says all these efforts will also help the wildlife adapt to future challenges like climate change. With the awareness of how dramatic climate change is occurring now uh, through global warming, uh, we are now seeing that the science is saying you need to connect populations so they can move northward <laughs> and they need to be able to move upslope on mountains. So what we had in mind turns out to be exactly what's needed for responding to climate change. The Y2Y project is still in its early stages, but things could start to change. Researchers spotted a grizzly in an area these animals had disappeared from for many decades. An encouraging sign for scientists trying to preserve one of the most important ecosystems of North America. Frédéric Zalak, CBC News, Banff National Park.